our supporters to reach all of our Guyanese people across this country and um, our diaspora in North America, Europe, everywhere. So as much as possible, please assist me in sharing the life so we can get the message out there. And this is especially important uh, during this period in our country. And I say this period meaning the advent of social media, but also the misuse of social media. Because social media and um, the accessibility that it has to reach people, the ability that it has to reach people is a good and a bad because there are many who are exploiting this reach. There are many who are using their social media platforms to misinform people. And there is an active uh, group of people who try every day. The vice president describes it as a misinformation industry where they try every day to misinform people, to give them the wrong information, to give them false information, completely inaccurate information. And they try to paint a picture of our country and of the situation and of a situation in Guyana that does not exist. And you know, sometimes you watch these things on, on social media or you switch on your television or you go on the Facebook and you can't believe your eyes and your ears. You wonder sometimes which Guyana are they talking about? Because you and I know all decent, right-minded, thinking Guyanese know that we are living in a country now that is the fastest growing economy in the world. We are living in a country that is now set on a path to prosperity. We are living in a country that is yet to experience its brightest days. Its brightest days are ahead of us. And we want to stay focused on that. We have to stay focused on that. Our country has been through tremendous trials and tribulations going back through our history. And you know, last week I took some time very early in the program to walk through some of the events in our past from our uh, distant past as well as our recent past and what we went through in 2020 to ensure that democracy was restored, uh, to ensure that Guyana remains one of the, the shining, the, 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 one of the brightest stars um, in, in our global economy. And we know that we have the potential to do that. We know that we have natural resources. And I'm not just speaking about oil, I'm speaking about all of the natural resources that our country has been blessed with. And when you hear people from the opposition speak about Guyana, you have to wonder if they're living in a different universe because that is not the Guyana that you and I know. And every day we see progress in this country, especially over the last two years, we are seeing tremendous progress on the, the PPPC government. And we can, we can go on and speak at length about all of the things that we have been doing over the past two years, and many of you know, because using that same social media, you get that information. Many of you have been impacted personally. Your lives have been impacted personally, and so you know what I'm talking about. And every day you see progress. Every day you see the government at work. Every day you see the government improving the lives of the people of our country. Wherever you live, it doesn't matter if you live on the coast, you live in the hinterland, it doesn't matter your religion, your race, the cabinet is everywhere, the president 
is everywhere this afternoon. He was in Tocqueville. No community is too small or too big. No community is insignificant. No group of people is more or less important to us. All of the people of our country will benefit under our government's policies and have been benefiting under our government's policies equally, equally and equitably. And wherever people are in need and wherever there are problems that have to be solved and solutions that have to be, um, that have to be met, we will be there to fix those issues. Everything cannot happen at one time because there was tremendous neglect, especially during the AP and new AFC period, 2015 to 2020. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But we have a lot of catching up to do. And the PPPC has been doing an excellent job at keeping up the pace. Many people thought when they start, when they saw us hit the ground running and, and, they, and we were going at a pace, many people said it's not sustainable and you know they're going to run out of steam. Oh, I think after two and a half years almost, um, they, those people would change their minds because if we were going to run out of steam or run out of gas, uh, we probably would have already. But that is not the case. We made a commitment to the people of our country that we will deliver on every single one of our promises and that we will remain humble and accessible to the people. And everyone, the president, the vice president, the prime minister, we have all been uh, accessible. We've been ensuring that we deliver on our commitments to the people. And two and a half years in, and there is no sign of slowing down. So you can imagine the next uh, two and a half to three years, what it will be like and how much more progress you will see over the next three years because you now have the first two years that you can, you can compare the progress and the, the accelerated progress that you have seen in two years. So in three years um, looking ahead, there is much to look forward to. So all of the issues will be addressed and we will be in every single community um, to meet with people and to continue to give them correct information as I said at the beginning of this program and that is why um, I want you to, to share the, the live so that we can reach as many people as possible and we're going to go through some of the false narratives that you have been listening to. And that's why this program and many other programs like this, when you hear uh, ministers of the government or our MPs who have similar programs that are speaking to you, they are trying to get the correct information to you. Because the last thing we want is people to make assumptions or to make decisions based on false information. And you know, that is the, the general posture of the opposition and more specifically the posture of the opposition leader. So every Tuesday, for example, he has a press conference and you know he's, um, I'm reminded of a James Brown song every time I hear Aubrey Norton speak, you know, he talking loud and saying nothing. And that is Aubrey Norton, you know, he sits down at the press conference and he sits erect and he has this posture where um, he seems elevated, you know, and uh, he puts on, puts on ears that he's better than everybody else and he's unfazed by the reporters and the questions he's being asked and very often gets into confrontation with the reporters who are asking him questions. Once the reporters start digging into the details of his prepared speech and his prepared presentation that he reads, once they start to ask him about the details of his presentation, of his script, um, you know, is the, the, the bigger he 
puffs his chest and, and gets into an argument with them and um, tells them to go and find out, they can go find out. But he's the one saying these things. Like last week with the imaginary poll that, that Norton spoke about, that there is a, a poll that shows that the APNU AFC is tipped to win the next election. Now, if I am the, the, the leader of a political party and I have a poll in my possession, or I'm aware of a poll that shows my party winning, I want that the results or the chart or whatever is showing me those results. I want it plastered everywhere. I want it in the newspapers. I want it on the television, on the Facebook page. I want to talk about it. I want to go into detail and break down the numbers for you and, and show you that I'm winning, that I'm ahead, and, you know, and to intimidate the, the, the other parties. Norton has the poll, he says, and it's, it's covered down, you know, it's, it's hiding. And then he told the reporter they could go look for the poll and then he can't um, disclose the name of the person who conducted the poll. Utter nonsense. All of it is nonsense. So just imagine the leader of the opposition, the main opposition party, a coalition party, and, and this is what he has to offer. This is the substance of his press conference every week. They, he's reduced to just making things up. And this is the misinformation industry that the, the Vice President and General Secretary of our party is speaking about. And when you listen to these people, you, you sometimes have to question their sanity because you, I cannot believe that they would use their position and use a platform to spew some of the nonsense that you hear. And I wa often wonder, who are they talking to? Who are they talking to? Who is listening? Who is their audience? Who are they hoping to convince to vote for them in 2025 with false information like the obviously false information like this because not even a child would believe that such a poll exists and you don't want to show it you don't want to show the results does that remind you of something the mysterious statements of poll Aubrey Norton likes these polls and and you know the the statements of poll that also supposedly shows a victory for AP and UAFC still has not surfaced up to now. And uh, Aubrey Norton, instead of, I mean, if I were in his place, and I know my party tried to rig the election, but I wasn't around, you know, because the vice president refers to him as a junior functionary, and, and he's absolutely correct. So I would have capitalize on my junior functionary status and said, uh, you know, I didn't see any statements of poll. That was, that was this other guy, somebody else. And steer clear from rigged elections. But Aubrey Norton, in his lack of intellect, in his stupidity, embraced it, said that he saw the poll the poll, the statements of poll, and that it shows a victory for the APNU AFC, and that when the time is right, he will um, produce these statements of poll. Now, I don't know when the time will be right. President Irfanali, the legitimate elected president of Guyana, the people's president, the man who everybody loves, has been president now for over two years. So I don't know when would be the best time or the, the right time for Aubrey Norton to produce his SOPs. But, you know, good luck to him. And so they have to use these, speak of these frivolous things, invent things to speak, because, simply because, they cannot speak about their record in government. 
the APNU AFC has no record in government. And so whenever they have an opportunity to speak, they have to invent things to speak of. So Aubrey Norton talks about who is incompetent and who, you know, when, when he's during his, his press conference. The APNU AFC was a colossal failure in government. Those five years, and, and we have to remember these things, you know, time is moving very quickly. And people have short memories. And very soon, people's memory will begin to fail about, or fade about what they went through in 2020. Those of us who were on the ground, and those of us who actively, were actively involved in the fight to restore democracy and to see the legitimate uh, results be declared, will never forget. I even have dates and times in my memory I can tell you on which date Lowenfield produced which report because I was there and I lived it. I experienced it. It was, it was a traumatizing experience. So I will not soon forget what that was like when I was fighting shoulder to shoulder with my brothers and sisters, people who love democracy and freedom and free and fair elections. We were all there. Whether we were washing containers, whether we were sitting in Artichung to, to ensure that the recount um, was conducted properly and the right results declared, whatever we were doing, whether we were on television, whatever we were doing, we all fought with all of our strength, all of our might, to ensure that people's votes were counted. And APNU can't speak about that period. They prefer to forget that period took place. And they can't speak about their record in 2015, during the period 2015 to 2020. Let's not forget what those five years were like. Let's not forget the aloofness. Let's not forget we had an absentee president, the cardboard president, who we never saw, who we can count on one hand how many times he faced the press, faced the media and spoke to the country and gave answers and accounted to the people of this country for what he was doing and what was the vision of his government. There was no vision. This country was at sea for the period 2015 to 2020. We must remember that. We must remember how slow the economy was, how slow things used to move. We must remember the people who lost jobs. We must remember the 7,000 sugar workers that were dismissed, the 2,000 Amerindians that were dismissed, the people from the call center in Linden their stronghold, the call center that they closed and sent the people home. We must remember the failures in the education system. We must remember how the health sector deteriorated under Valle Lawrence, how there was always a shortage of drugs. We must remember the fatalities and the amount of complaints people had when they went to Georgetown Hospital during those years. We must remember the corruption and the scandals. Those are too many to list tonight. The drug bond scandal, the 18 million signing bonus scandal that Jordan said was a gift, the scandal involving the, the, the sale of lands to BK, that, that multi-million dollar value land, lands valued hundreds of millions of dollars that Jordan sold for $20 million. The scandal with him and the vehicle, Patterson and his list of scandals, bed sheets, bangles, 
the scandal with the feasibility study for the Demerara Harbor Bridge. Imagine a load of sand in drop yet for st to start the bridge. An excavator has not been mobilized as yet and Patterson already in a scandal. And he indicted the entire cabinet in the scandal with him because he took a paper to cabinet for the award of a contract for the feasibility study for the bridge. Cabinet does not award contracts. The cabinet simply issues a no objection. So he took the whole cabinet with him and got everybody to participate in the illegality. And, you know, I can, I can go on and on with, with, with the, the lack of uh, maintenance in our roads. And that's why so many people complain now about the poor condition of their roads. We had zero maintenance of our infrastructure when Patterson was there, when the AP and UAFC was there. There was no spending on capital projects. And the, the, the vice president speaks about this a lot. They had massive allocations in the budget on the recurrent side of the budget, but they were not spending on capital projects. That is the, the schools, the hospitals, the bridges, the infrastructure, sea defenses, protecting our country from climate change. There was no proper planning. So all of the money went to the recurrent expenditure, and that's how we had exorbitant spending on food and, and parties and travel. That's where the money went. The money didn't go to fund scholarships for young people and for ordinary people who couldn't afford it. Scholarships were issued to the members themselves, the cabinet members themselves. They took scholarships for themselves. They took salary increases for themselves. They didn't give money for scholarship for ordinary people. Now, I don't have to ask you to contrast that to what we are doing now. I'm simply reminding you of the period when they were in office because it's very easy to forget about their record and their record of undemocratic practices as well as broken promises. And I sat on this program from 2019 to 2020 and I would have the AP and UAFC manifesto here with me, the 2015 to 2020 manifesto, and we would go through it page by page. And I took that time during that year, page by page, to show you one broken promise after another. They were so incompetent and so visionless and non-committent that they could not even achieve their first 100 day plan. They never got past the 100 days. So much less the entire APNU AFC manifesto. Their failed track record in the housing and water sector. Well, that, that was a miserable track record. So much so that I, I, I don't know why anybody from the AP and UAFC would even speak about housing. Because that, their record in the housing and water sector is so bad that if I were them, I wouldn't even touch it. I wouldn't even speak about it. So, but we, we're gonna come to that. But I'm just highlighting these sectors to you. The lack of maintenance at GPL with the electricity infrastructure no maintenance, they didn't add any new generation of power. Similarly, in the water sector, we inherited a bankrupt agency, both GPL and GWI on the verge of bankruptcy. No maintenance in the infrastructures, no spending on power generation or on uh, new uh, plants to ensure that there is treated water or access to treated water for our, for our people. Granger said, very much like um, 
Aubrey know. Well, Aubrey t tells the reporters, Norton tells the reporters to they must go look for for the poll and they must do their own research and all of these things. So he wants to be able to be allowed to sit and say whatever comes to his mind without any accountability. And when he's questioned, he sends the reporters to go looking for, for the sources. So he wants to have the freedom to say whatever he feels like saying without being questioned and uh, without producing the evidence to the people. Remember, I, I am reminded of when Granger said that when we always accused him of not having a plan for the country, and that's not an accusation, but it was proven that they had no vision and they had no plan for this country. Remember what he said? On an election platform, on a campaign platform, Granger said the plan is in his pocket. That's a kind of insulting thing that they used to say, and, and they even say it now. They insult the intelligence of people, people who deserve answers. If you are going to the electorate and asking people to vote for you, you should convince people of why they should vote for you. You should lay out your plan. You should lay out your vision. You should tell people, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to do it, and this is when I'm going to do it. You have an obligation to the electorate. You have an obligation to the people of our country. Tell them and to make your case as to why they should support you. But they, they are the incompetence. They are the incompetent ones. And they are the ones that have no plan. And they have no experience on how to implement any project, and they have no experience on how to run a government. And we saw that very clearly during the period 2015 to 2020. Not only are they inexperienced, but they lacked political will. They lacked the will to do the right things. They lacked the will to do anything at all. Some of them were absent from their ministries for months at a time. They had no idea on how to get things done. They had no idea on how to get the economy moving. They had no idea on where to spend money to see results, on how to grow the economy. I don't know who was advising them. And I don't know who's advising Norton now. And that's why everybody is running away from him. He's in one direction and everybody else is running in a different direction. Because, well, I, the, the General Secretary's um, label of him comes to mind again. It's a useless leader. Completely useless. All of them. When you listen to their presentations in Parliament, you see the uselessness. And that's what we have to go and debate. There's no inspiration in the National Assembly when you listen to them speak. No substance they don't have. They come there and they spew all kinds of rhetoric and, and, and talking points without anything to back up what they're saying and without any examples of what they have done or any success, successful project that they have implemented and that this is why their suggestion would be better than what we are offering. Nothing like that. So we have to be aware of them. We have to understand that these are empty vessels empty vessels and we cannot allow them to stir up anything inside of us they have no moral authority to speak on any of these matters because they have a failed track record and i see aubrey norton using things now like people centered since when is the term people centered associated with the coalition government. Whenever, when has the coalition government ever been people-centered? All of the people-centered policies that we had 
in place when they took office in 2015, they reversed. All of them. And, and I can go through them again. Simple things like the school children grant they took away. That is a people-centered policy. That is a people-centered program that is focused on our children. $10,000 they took away from the school children as it was back then. They are the government that put VAT on education. The most outrageous policy I've ever seen in any government anywhere in the world. Putting a tax on education. And they care about children? And they care about young people? They have lost with, with the, the imposition of that tax on education for one year until we fought for it to be removed. That one policy alone discredits them and they should have nothing more to speak about education or about children and young people. Vat on electricity, vat on data, vat on water, where our poor people and our pensioners, our old folks, making it more expensive for them. Remove the subsidies from the pensioners for electricity and water. Vat on building materials, on medical supplies, on basic food items, over 200 basic food items, putting tax on that. Those are people-centered. Those things affect people. So how can you claim to be a people-centered government when that is your record? We had people-centered policies which they removed and then they imposed hardship taxes and hardship policies on those same people who were benefiting from the real people-centered policies. They speak about, you know, President Granger, President Granger as he was um, during those, those years, was a military man and removed the joint services bonus. And, and I can, you know, go through a long list of the policies that we had in place that they reversed that was not benefiting us was benefiting people ordinary people and they took it away they removed it and then on top of that imposed taxes they said they wouldn't raise taxes and then they introduced new taxes as well as raised existing taxes taxation and fees and all of that which we committed to immediately removing and reducing once we took office. And you and I all know that that was done immediately. Within the first few months in office, we reversed all of the hardship measures and we restored all of the people-centered programs, policies, cash grants, etc., to the school children and increased it, increasing our pension, um, the pension to, to our uh, elder folks and so on. Housing is another sector, like I said. The Ministry of Housing was relegated to a department and you claim to love people. The Ministry, there was no Ministry of Labor. That was a department again. And what better ministry to represent the people and workers' rights than the Ministry of Labor? And you didn't see it important or necessary to have a ministry of labor. You removed that, put relegated them to a department. So that is a record that Norton and all of the, the people on the, in the APNU AFC, that's what they should speak about. And like I said, I don't know and I can't understand why they would even touch the topic of housing. When we know what their track record in the housing sector is, 7,000 house lots in five years with no new development, no new housing scheme, no investment, no new investment in infrastructure. They, have, they didn't develop a single new house lot. 
they were piggybacking on the programs that we left there and in the housing schemes and the vacant lots within housing schemes. That's what they were allocating. They didn't develop any new housing scheme. And this brings me to yesterday's press conference. You know, if I listen to Aubrey Norton's press conference once a week on a Tuesday, I have an entire program on Wednesday. So I don't even have time sometimes to speak about what we are doing in, in, in government. But I know that we have ample opportunities during the week and the president and all of the ministers, we speak about uh, what we're doing in government and our programs a lot. So we have opportunities to do that. But so it's important that we analyze and we keep track of what they're saying and what they're doing. Sometimes it's exhausting. Listening to the nonsense they say sometimes is exhausting. I, I can't listen to Arby Norton, for example. So I get the, the transcript, and I would read that. And I would read this in five minutes, because like I said, it lacks substance. It's, it's, and when you, when you see the language and, and, and you see how it's written and read, you know, my children can write a better script than this. So there's no serious analysis. There is no serious um, proposal when he speaks. There, he doesn't speak about a project and give the details of any project or any proposal that they would have in government. Or they can't even criticize us properly. And he is so incompetent, this Norton, and, and wasn't even paying attention to what his own government was doing 2015 to 2020. So yesterday, he started to speak again about the housing sector. And he said that he was um, driving through the new road. Now this is the, the new road he's referring to, is the interlink road. And he's mentioned the bridge, so that is the new Mocker Bridge and the interlink road that goes from Mocha, that goes um, through several communities, uh, Providence and from, from Providence and Prospect, and you have a, uh, some communities along that road, it goes all the way to Diamond. So that's the road he was traveling on. And he said this, let me, let me just play it for you, I won't repeat it. Hear it from Aubrey Norton himself about these houses and here listen to how he describes these houses may i also add on this question of houses and size i'm traveling along the um, east bank the road through providence there and i saw some kitchen coops being built i saw some also um just as you cross the bridge now, I don't know if the government recognizes that if you develop houses below a certain size and you put families in them, you are creating some difficulties for the family. You imagine a family of three or two, three in a one bedroom, where you need for division between male activities and children activities. Sometimes I think this government lacks brain power. Unless they are saying they are only going to give those to bachelors and single women, then they are creating conditions for children to not be brought up in the right environment. Aubrey Norton for you. Aubrey Norton, I agree with you. I agree completely with you that those houses are too small. And that's why we didn't build those houses, Aubrey Norton. It was your party when they were in government that built those houses in 2019. Those houses that Aubrey Norton passed and that is now criticizing were houses that were built by the APNU AFC 
government when they were in office in 2019. And he's criticizing it. Now, he's, he made very derogatory remarks. There are people and there are families who are living in those homes. I agree. The homes are too small. I wouldn't refer to them as a chicken coop as he refers to it as derogatory mark. He thinks he's somehow hitting the PPP program. But this is why I understand why the vice president has to refer to this man as a junior functionary, because he doesn't seem to know the, his own track record, his own party's track record of what they did when they were in office. Those houses were built by the coalition government in 2019, a 400 square feet home for $4 million. The PPPC has never built a home of 400 square feet and sold to people. We have a 400 square foot home on the, an IDB program that is given to people for almost free of cost. All they pay is $100,000. And they get a, four, a smaller home. Can't remember if it's 400 square feet or, but it's smaller than the ones we are building. And that's being done through the IDB. And those are almost free, as I said. The value is $4 million and the beneficiaries pay $100,000. They built those homes through their housing program and sold them for $4 million in prospect. Those are the houses Arby Norton is referring to. He's not referring to our low income housing model that we are building because he wouldn't refer to them as chicken coop. Those are 600 square feet home, homes that are being built for $5.2 million. Cheaper cost per square footage and is much bigger and more spacious and given on bigger land than was given to those people who received those homes in prospect. And one of them, the wooden home that you saw, was indeed a one-bedroom home. We have never built a one-bedroom house. Not even if a house is being given for free. We have never constructed a one-bedroom house. That is APNU, AFC's legacy. That's what Arby Norton is criticizing. And that's what, why we're saying he is no better or worse than Granger because he is... He's at sea in the same in the same way that Granger was at sea. They're all sailing. They don't know what's going on. Because he would have known that that was their project and he wouldn't have criticized it. He would have seen it, put his head straight, drive past it. But he thinks it's the PPP build that. And you know, I don't blame him because he re really the PPP does everything in this country. But whenever they do something, it's a failed project. And that's what you see there. But he wouldn't admit that the road he is driving on, the road, the new road that he was driving on, he didn't give the PPP credit for that. And that was only built in the last two years. He didn't see the smooth road that he was driving on. He looked at the houses because he saw something to criticize. Well, guess what? It's your project. It's Norton's project. He has to own it because he's the leader of that party. So that's on him. So he's criticizing his own project. And that's why they have to resort to the rhetoric that they resort to. They have to speak about racism. They have to invent scenarios where people are discriminated against. Because when you do not have a track, a track record to run on, you do not have a track record to speak of, you have to invent things. And that's why so much time and effort from him and the members of his party to run this misinformation industry. And they have to continue with this and it's going to get more outrageous and more outlandish as we get closer and closer to elections. And now, local government elections is coming up. It's going to be on the 13th of March next year.
So they're going to ramp up the, the rhetoric. You're going to be hearing more and more outlandish things. They're just going to invent things at this point. And we cannot put anything past them because they have no record to speak of. Their record is rigged elections. Their record is corruption. Their record is increased poverty. Their record is decreased standard of living. Their record is hardship taxes, taxing the poor. That's their record. They have never done anything to uplift ordinary people in this country. So when Aubrey Norton speaks about, and several times yesterday, and when I read his transcript, I see him referring to people-centered development strategy. I don't know which people-centered development strategy Aubrey Norton is talking about. Maybe he can point us in the direction of where we can find this people-centered development strategy that he's referring to. I rather assume it's being kept in the same place that the SOPs are being kept. So we're not going to take Aubrey Norton uh, seriously with what he says, but we have to monitor the things that they are saying because it's very misleading and we cannot allow them space to mislead our people. And we cannot allow them the opportunity to say whatever they feel like saying without rebuking and re rebutting and setting the record straight. So every day, our General Secretary put it this way and it struck me, he said, every day, and I quote, I quote, every day we have to fight for the soul of this country. Dr. Barjak, do you put it like that? And he's absolutely correct. Because they play on Afro-Guyanese. They play on the feelings of Afro-Guyanese and inventing these discriminatory practices, as they put it, that you and I know and we all know do not exist. That any of the policies and programs that we have instituted as a government is across the board. Any program or policy that we have Everybody benefits equally. Every time we have a, an allocation, for example, an allocation program under the housing sector, it's in the full view of the public. Cameras are there, and you look into that audience, and you see the faces of Guyanese looking back at you. You see Afro-Guyanese, you see Indo-Guyanese, you see Amerindians, you see mixed people, you see young people, you see old people, you see people with disability. You see the faces of Guyanese looking back at you. We don't do anything in secrecy. Everything is done in the open. If there's a subsidy for pensioners, all of the pensioners get it. Not Indian pensioners get it or uh, supporters of the PPP get it. All of our programs, the scholarship program, a very successful scholarship program. I believe over 6,000 people have benefited already just in two years from our scholarship program. We publish the list. The list is there for the public to go and look at and to scrutinize. You can look at the names and guess if you want the ethnicity of the people on the list. We don't have anything to hide. The scholarship is not exclusive to PPP supporters or Indo-Guyanese. And it's certainly not being awarded to the ministers or children of the ministers of the government. Compare and contrast that to what we had on the, the AP and UAFC. And they want to talk about discrimination and discriminatory practice and inequality. These people have no moral authority to speak on any of this. And that's why I say I don't know who Arby Norton is speaking to when anytime he opens his mouth because I don't know who could possibly listen to this rhetoric when we know the truth to be very different. But expect it to become more outrageous as we get closer and closer to local government elections. Now, we welcome local government elections. 
when um, GCOM wrote to the Minister of Local Government and Regional Development, he immediately responded and he named the earliest date available for elections to be held, which is March 13, 2023. They accused the PPP of delaying local government elections. When it's GCOM who is in charge of the elections, and we were waiting for GCOM to advise us as to when they will be prepared to hold elections. And the chairman, Justice Claudette Singh, wrote the minister. She gave a period for which elections can be held next year, period between March and April. And we named the earliest date, which, was, which is March 13. So we look forward to delivering the same trashing that we delivered in 2016 when we had local government elections. Similarly, in 2018, when we had local government elections, we won 50 out of the, we won 52 out of the 80 local government authorities, the local, uh, sorry, the local authority areas that uh, we contested. It's 80 in total, we won 52, a resounding victory for the PPP at local government elections. In that one election year alone, 2018, we increased our seats at the city council by five. One election alone, 2018. That was an indictment on the government at the time. The government that was in power at the time, which is the coalition government. We increased our seats by five. So we have five members on the city council. But you and I know that that is not enough. That the city council and the city is still, still being run by the APNU. AFC councillors. And this has been this, the case for over 50 years. And this is why we can't, cannot see progress in the city as we would like to see it, and as fast as we would like to see it. All the city council does is collect revenue, collect their rates and taxes, and pay wages and salaries. They don't fix the roads, they don't clean the drains, nothing. This city council was against the cleanup campaign, the nationwide cleanup clean up campaign when the president announced the cleanup campaign. Can you imagine? Cleaning up the city is their responsibility. We are volunteering to do it, and they are against it. That's the city council that we have. So we have to get more people. I'm being told I have five minutes. I don't know where the time goes when I come on this program. But the, we're going to, so I'm going to pause on the, the elections. Well, I wanted to go through some of the nonsense that they were talking about, um, about the, the uh, clean list. And I th it seems like I'm going to have to dedicate a program to that. So I'm going to do that next week. I plan to get into that this week. But you know, when I start with them on their record, it annoys me, it upsets me. That these people can criticize anything that the government, that the PPP is doing when they have no track record of their own to speak of. So I can get carried away with that. But next week, I will speak of the, the, this whole uh, local government elections and this clean list that they want. Um, so I'll dedicate next week to that. But before I go tonight, let me just mention Rickford Burke the keyboard puppy, as I am going to refer to him as. He's a puppy because he reminds me of those, you know, those pet dogs that, you know, just make a lot of noise. And when you, when you approach them, they're just barking all the time. They're all bark, a whole lot of noise. But the minute you advance them, they run away. That's Rickford Bark. So it's all bark and no bite. So you saw he organized an event in, in Brooklyn over the weekend and fed the people there a diet of hate and racism. 
That's what you heard from the speakers who were there, painting a picture of a Guyana that does not exist, painting a picture of the PPP uh, administration that is not so. And, and you and I know this. And painting himself as a victim and that he was charged under the Cybercrime Act and he can't return to Guyana because, you know, he's going to be arrested and playing the victim. When he's over there using, sitting behind a screen to bully people and to call people all kinds of names, he was very disrespectful to Gail Teixeira. He cannot put his foot in Gail Teixeira's shoes. Gail Teixeira is a champion of democracy. Gail Teixeira is a champion of women's rights. Gail Teixeira has been fighting for justice and democracy and equality since Rickford Bork was a boy. That woman has a stellar reputation in government. That woman has given her life in service to this country. And he wants to speak disparagingly about her. Her character is unblemished. He, Rickford Burke, is a con man. And he's using those people in, in Brooklyn and taking advantage of them because the, the attorney general and the few local officials that he had there, elected officials in New York that he had there, feeding them this diet of racism and hatred, they are up for elections. Next Tuesday, November 8th, is elections in the United States, where, there will be re where will their senators and congressmen are up for re-election. So they're campaigning. And the people who are in that audience is their constituency. So they are hoping that those people go and vote for them next Tuesday. So they will tell them, they will drive fear into them and to force them to, to they're going to make them believe that this situation exists in Guyana and that somehow they care about them and they are going to protect them. But they must go out and vote next Tuesday in the elections um, in the States. I, I feel sorry for those people because they're not being given the right information, the correct information. I don't blame those people. I don't blame the attendees. It's people like Rickford Burke who's peddling these lies, who's peddling racism and hatred and painting himself as a victim. And ironically, he is criticizing the Cybercrime Act. Again, the Cybercrime Act is a creature of the APNU AFC when they were in office. Act number 16 of 2018, the Cybercrime Act was passed by the APNU AFC, Rickford Barks party. And now he is being charged under that same Cybercrime Act that his party passed. They criticize the housing, the houses. The houses were built by AP and UAFC. Criticizing the cyber, cyber Crime Act, the Cyber Crime Act was passed by the AP and UAFC. So the only things that they can criticize us on or criticize the status quo on are the things that they did or they implemented. So Rickford Bork is another one that we can't spend too much time on, but we must call him out on his his diatribe of racism and hatred. And I'm being told I'm, you know, we've, we're down to program time. I'm, I'm completely out of time. Um, I had, again, lots more to discuss with you this evening, but, you know, my time is up. And I thank you again for joining me this evening. And next week, we're going to have um, a similar program. Next week, I'm going to be back. We're going to have a lot more topics. And you know the conversation will be um, just as interesting, and I look forward to getting correct information and being able to reach you again next week. God bless you. Have a good evening and the remainder of the week.